What's up, I'm Tommy, and Fujifilm's GFX100 is an incredible camera. When it was announced, a lot of the specs really resonated with what I look for in a camera, at least as a video shooter. Obviously a 102 megapixel mirrorless medium format camera with phase detect autofocus, sensor stabilization, and Fuji's film simulations has a lot of photographers green with gear envy, but I doubt I would ever be able to use a camera like this to the extent it was intended to be used for photography anyways. It's super overkill for my Instagram and overprocessed YouTube thumbnails. Using this camera, I can take a wide shot from across the room, crop in 90%, and still have a photo big enough for a high resolution billboard. So ignoring all of that, this basically has a lot of what the X-T3 does for video, like 4K, 10-bit 422, Eterna film simulations, 400 megabits per second, 24 frames per second, has a mic jack, HDMI out, port, and phase detect eye autofocus. So in a side-by-side -side comparison at a glance, it's got a medium format sensor instead of an APS-C size sensor, so the crop factor goes from 1.5 to 0 0.78, and the medium format sensor in this one is stabilized. So with one of the largest and most complex sensors available, there are a few really big disadvantages. For one, the body itself costs $10,000 and lenses are also discouragingly expensive. It's quite a bit bulkier and heavier than its little brother. And when recording video, roughly 92% of the sensors available pixels go just completely unused due to pixel bending and line skipping, which is basically just common sense and it's required to reduce the 102 megapixel image and achieve an eight megapixel image required for each frame in a 4K video. The math can also get a little confusing jumping between these camera bodies as far as switching between the focal lengths and lenses. The 120 millimeter lens the 120 millimeter macro lens is a 93 millimeter full frame focal equivalent. And the 32 to 64 millimeter lens is a full frame equivalent of 25 to 51 millimeters. And finally, the fastest native Fuji glass available for the GFX 100 is F2 with more lenses being around f2.8 to f4. Now you probably wouldn't want anything faster than f2 with this sensor size though. The depth of field would be getting into the the only thing interesting about my video is the blurry background territory. Working with a larger sensor has an opposite effect of working with a tiny sensor in that regard. I know people have pointed out that sensor size to bokeh ratio is like a scientifically inaccurate statement or whatever, and there's more to it, but that's my reality and that's what I'm gonna live with. So the question I have, is the Fujifilm GFX100 worth it if you buy it as a camera mint just for video? Let's get into it. So starting with recording media, you can use SD cards in the two SD card slots, or you can utilize the micro HDMI out port and just pick your poison. In my opinion, it's way more convenient to use SD cards. They're ubiquitous, they're small and lightweight. I mean, external recording just adds another step to my workflow and I'm more concerned about ease of use and efficient workflow and just not spending thousands building out a video rig. The camera itself is already a sizable investment, so I'm mostly gonna be talking about what the camera itself is capable of doing without expensive add-ons. That being said, the micro HDMI out port still makes external monitoring possible, which if you're filming yourself is pretty important because the built-in screen is not the flippy kind, though it is the bendy kind. There are a few other relevant and essential ports for filmmakers on the body of the GFX100. We've got the mic jack, the headphone jack and the USB-C port for charging the batteries or working with the camera or offloading media onto your computer. It supports USB power delivery so you can power it externally while you're using it. Without using external power though, you'll get between an hour and a half and two hours of 4K video footage with face detect autofocus enabled before it's time to change the batteries again. Now we're gonna run into a side-by-side -side of the X-T3 and the GFX100. The X-T3 has been one of my favorites ever since I got it. The autofocus is stellar and the film simulations give you a lot of flexibility to bake in the look you want or keep it flat and do some post. The GFX100 brings most of that over to their system, but the autofocus does seem to be a little bit more sluggish than its nimble counterpart. Comparing Eterna and standard profiles with identical settings show very similar images, but the GFX100 looks maybe a little bit darker. No correction was applied in this segment. The bokeh on the medium format GFX100 clearly is blurrier on a side-by-side, -side, though they're both at f4 and have the same full-frame equivalent focal length lenses. 
running through low light noise, ISO 2000 looks fine. ISO 5000 looks really great too with what looks like a natural looking film grain pattern instead of just ugly digital noise. ISO 10,000 looks usable in a pinch, but it really starts to fall apart around there. The sensor stabilization on the GFX100 is really incredible, combined with great autofocus, so long as you're not expecting a magic focus pull, and Fuji's colors, this shot of Tesla is a beautiful handheld example of what this camera produces in my studio. It gives me a lot of hope for what might come in the X-T4 as far as stabilization. The X-T3, on the other hand, doesn't have any stabilization, and my attempt here is clearly unusable. You can use the GFX100 on a gimbal, but it is kind of bulky and top heavy, so it's really difficult to balance. I was able to barely balance it on the Weeble S. I was able to balance it better on the Moza Aircross 2, but only in a vertical position. If you intended on using this with a gimbal, I would say the smallest gimbal you're gonna wanna get is probably gonna be the DJI Ronin S. Another issue you might run into is lens selection. Your lens selection is gonna be a little bit limited. The GFX lenses themselves are already kind of expensive, but then if you wanna use Fujifilm's new cinema lenses, those are way more expensive, but apparently they work on the GFX series. So you have to consider lens selection when getting a new body. Something kind of weird about the 120 millimeter macro is when the lens itself isn't on the camera and turned on, the uh, one of the elements in the lens is like, bouncing around in there, and that just makes me kind of uneasy. I feel like if, I, if the lens jars really hard, then it might break it. But when you turn the camera on and attach it to the body, it doesn't do that anymore. Also, the lenses in general, the whole camera, operating the camera in itself seems to be a little bit louder than you know most other mirrorless cameras I've operated. One, that's because the sensor is stabilized. It probably has to move a lot more to stabilize the whole sensor. The lenses have stabilization and It's just, they're just loud. Autofocusing is kind of loud. So just, there's a little bit more noise going on with this camera system than other options, which generally isn't as much of a problem for photography as it is for people trying to shoot video. Another drawback of buying the GFX100 just for video is there's no super slow-mo. And pretty soon people are gonna be asking if 4K is enough. Yes, I mean, yes, I think 4K is enough. I don't think that we need 6K or 8K yet. Mirrorless consumer cameras are coming out now that offer 6K or 8K pretty soon. I mean, I already struggle enough with my storage workflow for 4K files at 150 megabits per second. I don't really care to worry too much about 6K or 8K, especially if I'm recording internally. I mean, the file sizes that these new cameras are gonna be spitting out are gonna be just huge. So I, I don't think that you need more than 4K yet, but sometime in the next three or four years, it's probably gonna start looking like a really attractive feature in new cameras. I did hear there's a uh, update coming out that will unlock a 400 megapixel sensor shift photo mode for this camera, which is just absolutely insane. But let's sum up my thoughts on video first. Are there other cameras around $10,000 that can give you significantly better video features and performance? Absolutely. Are they medium format cameras that shoot 4K? No. In short, the GFX100 isn't a great value as a camera meant only for video shooters looking to make 4K video. But the added value it brings to people that buy this camera for photography is a stellar compliment for that feature set. And photographers that don't want to go buy and then carry around another camera just for video have everything they need in just one package so long as they needed a medium format photography monster in the first place. Also, it's the only camera like this that will give you 4K medium format sensor stabilized phase detect autofocus footage. This is your option for that right now. Now, my dream is if they would come out with a GFX 100V, which is like the GFX 100, but only meant for video. So, you know, knock the sensor down from 102 megapixels to like 22 megapixels, but keep it in the medium format size. Keep that stabilization, add that flip out screen, add some faster frame rates, like 120 frames per second and make an actual medium format 4K monster just for video, that would be really interesting. But I digress, this is an incredible camera for photography and it has some built-in video features too. 
It's a camera that targets a pretty niche audience. I did want to do some more in-depth testing and take it on some interesting locations with me, but I have to send it back to Fujifilm and if I dropped it, I'd have to take out a second mortgage on my house to pay for it. So I'm going to carefully package this back up and send it back to Fujifilm so they can take care of it the way that it's supposed to be taken care of. If you like this video, give me that thumbs up. And if you're new to the channel, feel free to hit the subscribe button. I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Stabilized.